I was praying, you know, and I was believing. I wanted to come here for a long time. Pastor Daniel uh, is a great influence in my life. Uh, when I first gave my life to the Lord in uh, like around 1998, I met Pastor Daniel, and, and he, was, um, he was younger, like I was too, and he was on fire for the Lord like he still is, but he had this anointing upon him, and we just became friends, and um, um, I actually backslid. I, um, I gave my life to the Lord for a couple years, and then I went away for like 10 more years, and I watched Pastor Daniel um, continue to be used by the Lord. And he continued to reach out to me. Uh, he never condemned me. He never um, was harsh on me. He was always very kind to me. And I had a great respect for him from a distance, watching what God was doing in his life. He was like a mentor to me uh, from a long way away. But um, listen, whoever motivates you, whatever they're doing, you watch them and you follow their lead. That's what a disciple is. Listen, you can't just want what someone has and not do what they're doing. That doesn't work. I try that. God, why do you deliver him, but you don't deliver me? Well, you keep going to the bars, and he doesn't. It's not that complicated. I begin to do what I watched Dr. Morocco do, another of the pastors. Pastor Colleen has been a great uh, inspiration to me. She believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. So some of you right now that don't believe in yourself, there's a lot more people that believe in you than you even know. There's people that are sitting around you that believe in you. There's parents, there's loved ones that believe in you. And you just got to position yourself to receive, okay? And I have a word I believe is from the Lord for you. Um, if you have your Bibles, um, we're going to kind of read a lot, so you can just remain seated. Um, but Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> we're starting in verse 16, and I'm just going to go 16 through 18 um, to start. I don't know if they have it on the board, but I can pull it up. But this is a very personal passage to me because I have witnessed this. I've lived in this. This is the living word. Hello, it's alive. You get inside of it. And guess what happens when the word gets inside of you? You begin to live the word. Don't just hear a good word and not apply it. That's knowledge that's wasted. Wisdom is applying the knowledge you know. Knowledge is great, but without action, what good is knowledge? Just knowing a lot. I always said I'd rather know less and do more than know more and do less because you're much more effective for the Lord when you're doing what you know. But Acts chapter 16, once, this is Paul, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit of which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. Verse 18, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed. Everybody say annoyed. annoyed. The devil can be annoying. Hello, does anyone else get annoyed by the devil and his team? Paul got so annoyed that he turned around and said to that spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. We're gonna stop right there for a second. The first thing you got to understand, they were on their way to prayer. Listen, I'm all for praying in bed. That's great. And I was actually doing it earlier today. But there's something different when you get up, you get dressed, you get in your car, and you make an effort to get to wherever there's a house of prayer and you pray. They weren't even praying. They were just on their way to prayer. But that power, that anointing that was upon them because they prayed, affected the spiritual realm. You will affect the spiritual realm when you remain in prayer. If there's nothing else you do in ministry and you just pray, you're gonna do okay. I'm not saying that's all you should do, but you start with that. That was the first thing that I did when I came to the Lord, came back to the Lord almost 12 years ago, is I came to the early morning prayer room and I sat on the floor and said, God, I'm not leaving until you deliver me. Deliver me from these addictions. Deliver me from the alcoholism. Deliver me from my anger, from my hurts, from my pain. I sat in the house of prayer and said, God, I'm not leaving. And guess what? I'm still in the house of prayer. He's delivered me, but I don't want to go anywhere because there's power in your prayer. You find a place to pray. I know they have an early morning prayer here. I think your early morning is like 10 o'clock, isn't it? <laughs> now we were up at 4.30 on Sunday. Dr. Mar yeah, we get up real early and we pray. But listen, I'm telling you, 
getting yourself to an early morning prayer meeting. And if you start out just once a week, I haven't stopped doing it for 12 years. I went seven days a week for like 10 years. Finally, my wife said, you're taking a day off. Just stay home one day. I'm like, okay, one day. By the rest of the six, I'm gonna be in prayer. That's how I start my day. Give my first fruits to the Lord. And I'm affecting the spiritual realm. God's using us as he was using these disciples in Paul. Because of their prayer, they made a difference. You know, uh, Pastor Kirsten mentioned that we have a transformation. We call it the lighthouse. And it's a um, sober living house for, uh, I call it a discipleship house. And I work in the prison as far as uh, I pastor in there. Um, and I meet guys in there. They have nowhere to go when they come out. And so we started this house about two years ago. And um, it was probably seven years ago, maybe five, five years ago, before um, we had opened the transformation house, I lived in Kihei at the time, and I had a neighbor across the street. He's not saved, but he's my friend. I love him. And guess what? I don't witness to him because he doesn't, it makes him uncomfortable. So I just, I'm his friend. It's okay. Some people just need to be loved. Sometimes you just got to be their friend. You don't have to hit them over the head with the Bible every time you see them. You're probably doing more harm than good. You got a big knot on their head because you keep hitting them. Stop it. Love them. Be kind to them. But I was over at his house, and we were just hanging out, talking story, and there's, there's somebody next door screaming, acting crazy. And I'm like, what's going on? And the guy, my friend, he's like, dude, I don't know. This guy's been screaming like this all night long. And I'm sitting there going, and I don't even think I was a minister yet. Like, I might have been close to it, or I was working in the church. But I told my friend who's not saved, I said, I'm going over there. He's like, What? I said, I'm going to go pray for the guy. He's like, what? I got to see this. And so he's, he starts following me to this neighbor's house. And we get there, and I knock on the door. And I'm like, what's going on? Is he okay? And the daughter comes up, and she has tears in his eyes. And he says, that's my dad. I said, does he need 911? Does he need an ambulance? No, no, he has night terrors. And he's just sleeping, and that's how he sleeps. It sounded like he was dying. He was being afflicted by an evil spirit. So I, man full of faith, Come on, sometimes you just got to claim it. You might not even feel like it. You start declaring, I'm a man full of faith. That'll build your faith. You start claiming you are something that you aren't. And you become what you're declaring. You call things that aren't as though they are. Listen, start calling yourself a millionaire and you'll be a millionaire. Declare it. Start declaring. So I go over to this house and I knock. The lady comes to the door. That's my dad. I said, do you think he would let me pray for him? And she goes, I think so. And there's some big guy, but he's laying down, like rolling, like sweating, like tattoos everywhere. I'm like, I'm like, Lord, you, I don't want him to grab me out. And she's like, go ahead and pray for him. So I start to pray. I just I reach over. I've been mean, literally, I'm being cautious. I'm, I'm not going to get hurt. I'm gonna, just, just in case. I begin to pray. I begin to pray in the name of Jesus, set this man free. Lord, I pray right now, you foul spirit, take your hands off of him. I started praying with power. I started praying by faith. I started praying under, under the unction of the Holy Ghost. And here are my non-Christian friends like, <laughs> watching me. I didn't do it for him. This man needed to be set free. I prayed for him. I don't know what happened. A couple years go by. Because it was a bed and breakfast that people had left the next day. A couple years go by, and we have the sober living house, and I have a guy calls me and says, uh, you know, I want to come to your sober living house. I heard about it through a friend of mine. I just got out of rehab. And so I went and picked him up, driving him around, took him to church. And, you know, I like to interview with him and spend a little time with him before I just let him come live with us. And all of a sudden, he's looking at me, and he's like, you look familiar. He's like, are you like a washed up, like, Hollywood child actor? I don't know if that's a compliment, or, but that's what he thought. I said, no, actually, I'm not, but I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. And then all of a sudden, we start to talk, and he says, you know, where do you live? I said, I live in Kihei. And he goes, oh, yeah, I used to stay in Kihei. I said, what street? Goes, oh, Lana Kila, Lana Kila. Yeah, I stayed at a bed and breakfast in Lana Kila, and someone came and prayed for me. And I was like, this is three years later. And he said, that day I was set free never to have another night terror in my life 
I had no idea. Listen, it's not your job to know what God's going to do. It's your job to believe that he can do. I didn't know that there was going to be a testimony. I didn't know if he was going to be set free. That wasn't up to me to know or me to do. My job was to pray. My job was to believe God could set him free, and God set him free. So you pray by faith. You believe, and you expect God to do it. And if he does, great. If he doesn't, you keep praying, and you keep expecting I said this this morning in Eagle River. I said, listen, your faith is not determined on the level of whether God does or doesn't do what you're praying for. That, that, listen, that's not faith. Well, I'll pray if you do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. No, that's not faith. You just keep believing. You keep praying. By faith, I prayed for this guy. Three years later, I get a testimony. He ends up coming to our lighthouse. He stays with us for about a year. He got reestablished with his family. He's back in California today. But it's just a great testimony. As did Paul. He got sick of that spirit. He got annoyed with it. He went and cast it out, and that spirit left. You guys have power. You walk in the power. A lot of that power that you have been given comes through prayer. You want a deeper anointing? You want a more power? You want a better understanding? You pray more. It's not that complicated. Just, just pray. Help, help me out here. I'm sure your pastor preaches you to pray, so make sure you pray. Make sure you believe. If you go ahead and drop down to the next two scriptures, it says, when her own, um, so at that moment, that spirit left her. And verse 19 says, when, he, when the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into a marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews, and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped, beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, which is basically tortured, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in an inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, Let's just hold on here for a second. They didn't do anything wrong, and they started going through hell. Some of us think we've done something wrong every time something bad happens. I'm guilty. What did I do wrong? I start, listen, sometimes you just go through stuff. Sometimes God allows you to go through things so you can mature. Other times, he's just allowing your faith to grow. These guys had done nothing wrong. Dude, I get a red light and I start questioning God. Where were, you? where were you? I was praying for a green light, but I'm running late. These guys, they didn't do nothing wrong and they're whipped, they're tortured, they're beaten, they're thrown into prison. Okay? They didn't do anything wrong. They cast out a spirit and they were going to prayer. And here they are, beaten, whipped, flogged, tortured, thrown into jail, thrown into the inner prison. It said the inner, it's basically the hole. It's the jail inside the jail. The most secure place in a jail. Thrown into stocks. Naked, bloodied, beaten. For what? You never heard them. Why, God? Why are you doing this to us? Listen, that's the worst question to ask God. If he even told you, you wouldn't even be able to handle it. If God told us why, we'd probably mess stuff up. If God revealed his whole plan for you, he, we might mess it up. Then God gives you a little bit at a time. He doesn't want you to mess up his plan for your life. But they didn't question their situation. Just because you're going through a hard time, just because something didn't go right, just because you feel like God's not with you, it doesn't mean he's not with you. It doesn't mean he's not going to bring you through it. Sometimes he allows you to go through things so you can get to that next level. So you can, you can stop drinking milk and you can eat some steak. You, you have to grow some teeth. You have to mature a little bit. If we just did everything for our kids every time they asked us to do something, they would never learn. God's allowing us to mature. He's allowing us to grow in the Lord. But the great demonstration of Paul and Silas is they never questioned God. I might be like, really, God? I just cast out a demon. I've been going to prayer. And hey, you know, really? I got to be up in this. I just got beat down. And help me. What's going on? They didn't question it. I'll show you what they did. If you go to the next verse, 28. 28 says, excuse me, 25. About midnight, everybody say midnight. midnight. Paul and Silas were praying 
and singing hymns to God and all the other prisoners were listening to them. Pray and sing at midnight after I just got beaten, stripped down, thrown into stocks, thrown into the hole. Pray and sing. Hello, he's given you the answer. They begin to pray and sing. And it said the other prisoners were listening. Do you know other people see your life? You're affecting other people by your prayer, by your worship. People are listening. People are listening to you by either what they're seeing or what they're hearing. Watch next what happens. It says that the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was such a, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken that once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up when he saw the prison doors open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Now watch this. Paul and Silas, prayers and worship set the other prisoners free. Your prayer, your worship will set your neighbor free. Your prayer and your worship will set your children free. Sometimes you just gotta stand in the gap. It didn't say the other, it did not say the other prisoners were worshiping. It didn't say that they were praying. It just said that they were listening and heard the prayers and the hymns sang by Paul and Silas. And then not just that, I'm like, God, they're not singing. Why, why are they getting released? I'm the one praying. I'm the one singing. It, what, they didn't, they're not only me, me, me. I only deserve God's blessing. This is a demonstration of what God can do through your prayer, through your worship. All the doors flew open, not just Paul and Silas, not just the ones that were praying and worshiping, but every Everybody's door flew open. Everybody's chains fell off. Now, I know it's family night. And I was concerned about touching on this, but it's very important. And I got confirmation when Pastor was speaking this morning. I want you, I'm going to help you because you're going to help somebody else. The prison, the jailer woke up. The jailer, he was sleeping on the job to you. <laughs> that's not what I'm going to help you with, but he was. The jailer woke up, was about to kill himself because he thought, everybody say thought. He thought the prisoners had escaped. What came upon that jailer was a spirit of suicide. Suicide is a very real thing. And when he be a pastor began to pray over your children, this is something that you need to help your kids understand. The spirit came upon the jailer because of a lie that he thought. Just because you think something, it doesn't make it true. Just because you think something doesn't make it right. He was about to take his own life because he thought everybody had escaped. Nobody escaped. Listen, I'm in the prison. In the last six months, we had three people commit suicide. Because of a thought in their head. This is how the devil works. This is how the spirit, this is telling us how the spirit works. And it brings a lie to your brain. And you begin to think, nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. I'll never get out of this. I'll never be set free. Why am I even here? Why don't you just take your own life? It's a lie. Please, don't believe the lie. That's why you have a church body. You share some of the thoughts that are going through your brain. All your thoughts are not from God. I mean, maybe yours, but mine aren't. I, I can assure you. Not all my thoughts are from God. If all of our thoughts were from God, he wouldn't say to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. You've got to weigh and you have to talk about some of the things that you're thinking in order to overcome them. You take it captive because you don't allow it to do whatever it wants in your mind. Don't let your thoughts do whatever it wants. You, you, you restrain them. That's what taking something captive, they can't move around in your mind how they want to whenever they want to. They're restricted. 
That's why you take it captive. Paul and Silas said, stop. We are all here. That is a great demonstration that freedom is not a physical location. Freedom is a place in the heart. These guys, listen, if I'm in prison, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes and shakes the prison, and all of a sudden my chains fly off and my door pops open, that's my sign to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You set me free. But nobody left because freedom is a place in the heart. I had a man stand up in prison. He said, Pastor Rice, I've never been more free than I am right now in prison. I've never been free out there, but I'm free inside here because he's not bound to the things of the world. All of a sudden, he's been separated from the strongholds, from the attacks of the evil one, the addictions, the abuse, the violence. Freedom is a place in your heart. They did not need to leave the prison. They were already free. God wants to free you. God wants to set you free. It's not a location in the natural. It's a place that only God can take you to. This is a great demonstration to me. They didn't need to leave. They said, we are all here. And then the jailer asks, The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas, verse 29, and brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It ultimately comes down to this jailer. Paul and Silas went through everything they went through, not only to demonstrate freedom through prayer and worship in the middle of prison, but all of a sudden one man's life wants to know, how do I be saved? What do I do? And he says, you believe. You have to believe you can get through your situation. You have to believe God can provide for you. You have to believe your children will walk in righteousness. You have to believe you'll be healed of your sickness. You have to believe. Lord, give me more faith to believe. All of a sudden, this is all the jailer wanted to know. How do I be saved? Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. I'm here to tell you, your whole household's gonna be saved. You keep praying, you keep worshiping, you keep believing. You know what? Some of you, this is a word from the Lord. You need to release your children to the Lord. The hardest thing I ever had to do as a father is say, take him, I release you. I release him to you, Lord. Because I was actually not helping him. I was actually hurting him by getting on his case and yelling at him and telling him you need to do this. And telling him. I was just making it worse. And I said, you know what, Lord? This is my son who I love very much and is doing great today, but I had blocked him. I said, Lord, you know what? I'm not helping him. Every time I talk to him, I make him more mad. I'm hurting the situation. He knows what he needs to do, but it's not doing well coming from me. So I released him to the Lord. This was about eight months ago, nine months ago. I blocked them. <laughs> I didn't even know how to block. I had to have my daughters help me block them. Block. Now watch what happens. I just pray. I just did a Paul and Silas. I didn't even worship. I didn't even pray and stand in the gap for my son. Kept believing, kept believing. And all of a sudden, I, Lord, can I unblock them? He's like, no, not yet. I talked to my son. My son's like 30, going to be 31. Lives on another island. And I just kept praying, Lord, I love my son. I've never done this to him. This hurts. I'm blocking my son. But I'm releasing him to you, Lord. Then all of a sudden, about three months pass. I'm like, how about now? Like every day, I'm like, come on, can I call? Can I unblock him? Can I unblock him? Finally, the Lord said, yes. My son calls and he says, he probably was calling a lot, but he calls. I see the phone ring, and he said, hey, Dad, I got three months clean and sober today. And then he says, can I pray for you? Yeah. 
You and your whole household will be saved. You guys got to be the anchor. I don't care if you're the kid praying for your parents. You be the anchor. You're the one God chose to be the anchor in your family. He chose the jailer in this situation. And the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And he says, just to believe. And then they begin to witness to him. He said, not only you, but you and your whole household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him. And to all the others in his house, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his whole household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before him. He was filled with joy because he and his whole house had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. He keeps repeating, he and his whole household. Hello, that's important. Some of you have broken families right now. I'm here to tell you, God's going to save your whole household. You keep believing. It's not that complicated. I talked about this this morning. Listen, we're complicated. We complicate God. God's not complicated. You are. I am. God's like, really, really, don't confuse yourself. Then. God's not a God of confusion. Just make the next right choice. That's how, I, that's how I teach my guys in the prison. You want to do good? Just make the next right choice. Seriously. You know, there's some programs that do one day at a time. I love that, but that's too much for me. I just got to make the next right decision. That one decision at a time. Because guess what? Let me assure you, all of us, this came up in the message this morning, but we're all only one decision away from prison. One decision away from walking out on God. Listen, sometimes we think we're all holy and we got all this time under our belt and God's blessed us. Listen, you aren't that holy. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Pastor Daniel, are you watching? Listen, sometimes we mess up as Christians. Sometimes we just got to humble ourselves. Sometimes we got to extend our hand to that homeless person. Sometimes we got to extend our hand to that prisoner. Sometimes we got to extend our hand and show humility and say, you know what? I want to see you and your whole household be saved. I, yeah, you might have been through this and through that, but God's given me a testimony. God's brought me through it. God's going to bring you through it. Before I was ever a pastor, when I used to go into the prison, they say, what's your title? I said, I'm an encourager. I encourage. And then all of a sudden, I was walking across the prison. And all of a sudden, over the loudspeaker. And I was, I was not even close to being a pastor or a minister. But they're like, one pastor walking. <laughs> they think I'm a pastor. Because I was a pastor in their eyes. Did you know you're the only pastor in some of the people's lives that they're going to ever know? Sometimes you're going to be the only Bible that anybody ever reads by the way you act, the way things you say, the places you go. You're going to be the hand of God extended. God's going to put people in your place, that, in your life, that will never be put in my life. You use what God's called you, what he's given you, excuse me. You use all that he's given you. You ask for those divine appointments. You stand in the gap, as did Paul and Silas. They stood in the gap for all those other prisoners, and God set everybody free. And I'm going to close this. What is God saying to us this morning? Go to prayer. Hello. Get up and go to prayer. What, what time is your early morning prayer? Seven o'clock, Monday through Friday. Monday through Saturday. I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Is that okay? How many can say right now that you know what? I'm going to commit. It's for a half an hour. One, seven to eight. How many here, by faith, okay, I'm not going to, don't say you're lying, but believe that you can make it, I don't, pastors included, you can make it at least three times a week to early morning prayer. Raise your hand high so everybody can see it. Come on. We hold each other accountable. Three days a week. That three days a week is going to set other prisoners free. That three days a week is going to see your family saved. Now, let me ask this next. Thank you all for being honest and making that commitment. Who can say they can do two days a week? You know what? I can do two days a week. There's, come on, there's more of you. All right, I see your hand. And one guy's like this. Two days a week. Okay, last. Who can say, you know what, I'm going to go one day a week. I'm going to stand in for my family. If you can only be here for a half an hour, they're welcome. You're welcome to come. 
Hello, somebody your schedules, there you are. You stand in for your family. You make that commitment. And some of you have schedules, won't allow it. But who can stand and say, you know what? I'm gonna pray every day for at least five minutes. I'm gonna take five minutes. Come on, raise your hand. You're gonna take five minutes a day. That five minutes a day is gonna set your family free. That five minutes a day is gonna open the prison doors. That five minutes a day, because you know what's gonna happen? After you do that five, you're gonna say, you know what? I wanna do 10. That was easy. And I like the blessing. God's hands upon my life. I'm walking in the anointing. And you'll desire to pray more. So God is telling us this morning to please get up and pray. Set a time apart. Set it. I mean, listen, like I said, praying in bed is awesome. But what usually happens is you fall back asleep. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. <laughs> what a great time with the Lord. <laughs> I, was, I was praying for at least an hour. <laughs> You prayed for one minute. You slept for 59. You called it prayer. <laughs> Go to prayer. Cast out some demons. Get annoyed with some of the attacks of the evil one. Listen, you have the authority. You have the power. Don't let any evil spirits come upon your children. Don't let them in your house. Don't let them to go around people in places that you know are going to be defiling to your family. Listen, you, you, before you know it, your kids are going to be making their own decisions, like pretty much all mine. And what I did with them is what I'm going to be accountable to God one day. What they decide to do as adults, guess what? I'm not going to be held accountable for that. But what I did with what God entrusted me with, I will answer to. You be very careful, as Pastor was praying this, morning, uh, this evening, about your family. You protect them. But listen, you get annoyed with evil. You start casting it out in the name of Jesus. Listen, you have power. You have the authority. Cast it out. Don't be afraid. Let your worship and prayer be known. Others will see it and hear it. Let your life speak for itself. There's a lot of you, a lot of people in our church in Kihei that, that have a lot of really good things to say. But I'll tell you right now, if your life's not backing up what you say, you're better off just keeping your mouth shut. Uh, hello, I was guilty of a life like that. Fighting over religion in a bar. Oh, my God, my God, my God. My God. <laughs> I slap myself, bam. Let your life shine through your action, through the way you speak to people, through your generosity. Listen, generosity isn't limited to money. Someone just needs an ear. They want you to listen to them. I don't know if you knew this, but I'm a professional counselor. I listen and I pray. I'm not professional. You want counseling? Okay, I'll listen and I'll pray for you. I'm telling you. I've seen some of the greatest breakthrough with just listening to people and praying for them. Right before I came here, the last two people I saw was Dr. Morocco and Pastor Colleen in the parking lot, and, and I... It just got shook, and the devil kind of rattled me with something with a person right before I left, and I went over to him like, ah, I kind of blew it. I kind of got upset, and, and I just feel junk about it. Pastor, oh, let me pray for you. Uh, he just goes right into prayer. I've heard enough. Let's pray. Oh, the Jesus, come on, bless him. I will save him. Listen, hello? It's not your job to share all your insight. It's your job to pray for people. Lay hands on them and believe God can deliver them. And lastly, and lastly, so we're going to go to prayer. We're going to cast out demons by faith. We're going to let our prayer and worship be known through our life. We're going to be reminded that our prayer and worship will set others free. Okay, your prayer and worship will set others free. Remember, just because you get a thought in your head doesn't make it true. Please. A thought will kill you. That's what it's saying here. I, I'm not saying this. this is what the Bible says. This guy was going to kill himself over a thought that was a lie. Don't let your thinking control you. That was for somebody tonight. You, you take captive your thoughts. Stand in the gap for your family. Listen. I don't just come to prayer for me. I come to pray for my family. I come to pray for Alaska. I come to pray for the prison. I come to pray for the people at my workplace. I come to, listen, we're not selfish individuals. We're covering you. 
you come and cover someone else. Because he, he who refreshes others, he too will be refreshed. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior, and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.